A lot of energy in here today. I hope it's all positive energy. It's what? I guess we're not DNA then. We're not DNA? We're not negatively charged. Oh, but it can be negatively charged and still positive energy though, right? I guess. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm just going to say a few things um, about characterizing proteins, and then I'm going to turn to what is year in, year out, the most popular lecture I give. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. I enjoy giving it. And um, you're going to learn a lot more today about hemoglobin than you um, ever imagined existed. Okay? It's a remarkable protein. Before I talk about that, I do want to talk uh, about a couple of techniques that um, are used to uh, study proteins. I've, I've alluded to both of them. Um, and I can assure you we're not going to go through and learn how we do these. But I do want you to know what they're useful for. Okay? So one of these techniques is called x-ray crystallography. And x-ray crystallography is a technique for determining the, I would say, I won't want to say absolute, but it's very close to the absolute structure of a protein. Okay? And by that I mean that with the technique of x-ray crystallography, what one can do is one can, um, using some very sophisticated computer and mathematical analysis, determine the position in three-dimensional space of atoms in a protein. Okay? That's a really, really cool thing to be able to do. Okay? The idea is that you take um, a completely pure protein, that's what we've been working on getting with all these things, and put it into a solution and let the solution very, very, very slowly evaporate. And if you do it right, what you end up getting with this is um, or, or, or are crystals that precipitate out of the solution. The crystals are, they, they contain only the uh, protein that you're studying. And this can be done with DNA and RNA as well, I should point out. But it contains only the molecule that you're studying, and it's in a perfect crystalline uh, array, meaning that everything is perfectly spaced, perfectly aligned with each other within that crystal. It's akin to making ice which also perfectly aligns um, all of the individual molecules of ice together. Okay? Oh, except for we're talking here about a protein, which is a very big thing. All right, if you take that perfectly aligned crystal and you um, shoot x-rays through it, what you discover is that the x-rays don't just go, they don't just pass right straight through it. In fact, what happens is they get what we call diffracted, meaning they get bent. And the bending happens as a result of the interaction with the x-ray with the electron clouds of the atoms within that crystal. Now, if you think about this, this means that the electron clouds, which surround, of course, the nuclei, if we extrapolate back and figure out where those bendings occurred, how those bendings occurred, and so forth, we can ultimately determine the position of those electron clouds. And that's what we're doing in x-ray crystallography. As I said, ultimately, using information from x-ray crystallography, we get 3D, that is x, y, and z coordinates, 3D information for the atoms within that protein. Well, that turns out to be really, really useful. This is the work of biophysics. People say, well, what, is bio what do biophysicists do? This is one of the things that they do. They determine these molecular structures and if you think about it now, you've got, let's say, 10,000 atoms in a protein. And you know the x, y, z coordinates of all those atoms. You know where the alpha helices are. You know where the beta strands are. You know where the bends are. You know the overall shape of the molecule. You know the molecular dimensions of that protein. You know the place where molecules bind to that protein, and if it's an enzyme, where they get catalyzed. Okay? That's really, really useful information. And it's not just esoteric information. Because if you are trying to design a drug to knock out an enzyme, let's say a, polymer, a DNA polymerase of HIV, you know the exact dimensions that your drug needs to have to fit in to plug up those sites. All right? So this kind of information is sought by drug companies. Um, it's one of the reasons biophysicists are very much in demand, because they hold the keys 
to molecular structure. Okay? Very, very useful, very, very powerful information. It's not a trivial process. And this is one of the reasons people would love to be able to predict structure simply from amino acid sequence. Not quite there yet. Okay? All right. Another related, I shouldn't say related, but another technique involving electromagnetic radiation that allows us to determine molecular structure is probably something you got in organic chemistry lab, and that's nuclear magnetic resonance, or what's known as NMR. Okay? NMR. NMR relates to the spins of nuclei. Nuclei have inherent spins associated with them, and um, it's more than we're going to go into here, but suffice it to say that we study the absorption of electromagnetic radiation and how they affect spins of those nuclei. And what this information in nuclear magnetic resonance tells us is how nuclei are interacting with each other. Okay? We get something about molecular distance. And though it's a very different kind of an analysis, and in some ways more complex kind of an analysis, nuclear magnetic resonance can also give us 3D information about proteins. You might say, well, why do it if it's more difficult or whatever? All right. Well, the answer is that nuclear magnetic resonance does not rely on crystals. In the case of X-ray crystallography, we, uh, sorry, we had to use crystals to get our information. Well, you worry when you have a crystal, is that the way it behaves in solution? Just because it crystallizes doesn't mean that's the way that the enzyme actually looks when it's in solution. Nuclear magnetic resonance can be done in an aqueous solution. So it gives us information about structure in the native environment in which the enzyme might exist. That's really useful. OK. So those two techniques together, and oftentimes they are combined, those two techniques together give us a tremendous amount of information about the structure of macromolecules. Proteins are the most common things that are studied, but we can also study DNA and RNA in this fashion. OK. Questions about that? Yes? Is your sample of whatever the protein mm -hmm. that you're testing, is it still preserved and usable for another purpose after NMR? Question is, if, is the sample still usable after you've done NMR on this? Um, in theory, it would be because you're not denaturing it. But uh, in reality, the amount that you would use is small enough, it probably wouldn't be a factor for you to go and use for another purpose. But good question. Yep. OK. Well, that's what I want to say about characterizing uh, proteins. I'm not going to talk anything more about other things there. I want to in instead turn our attention to hemoglobin, which I think is one of the most amazing proteins that is found in our body. Okay. Hemoglobin um, and myoglobin, we talk about them together because they um, are related to each other. We'll see they have some differences, but they're related to each other. We learned when we learned quaternary structure and tertiary structure that myoglobin had tertiary structure, but it didn't have quaternary structure. What did that mean? Nobody remembers that. Yes? OK, so tertiary structure, things that have tertiary structure but not quaternary structure will only have one subunit. They won't interact with other subunits. Things that have quaternary structure will have subunits that interact with each other. So myoglobin has tertiary but not quaternary structure because it's only one single subunit. Hemoglobin, on the other hand, has four subunits that interact, two identical units called alpha, and two other identical units called beta. Okay. In both myoglobin and in hemoglobin, they have something we call a functional group. And a functional group is a molecule that's not an amino acid, that helps a protein to do something. A functional group is a molecule that's not an amino acid that helps a protein to do something. The functional group that both myoglobin and hemoglobin have is known as heme. That's where hemoglobin gets its name. And myoglobin also has a heme. The heme, as we will see, is flat. It's a flat ring, or a set of rings, I should say. A flat set of rings, in the middle of which 
is found an atom of iron. Hemoglobin is one of the reasons that you have to have iron in your diet. There are other reasons, but that's one of the reasons you have to have iron in your diet. It's the iron part of the heme that grabs onto oxygen. So we think about hemoglobin's role in the body is to carry oxygen. It carries it by the oxygen getting attached to the iron and being carried. In the myoglobin, the iron also attaches to oxygen, but we'll see that myoglobin's function in the body is a little bit different than hemoglobin's. Okay? Let's look at some of the things I'm talking about. Here is the structure of one of the subunits of hemoglobin. This is the beta subunit. And if I were to show you the alpha subunit, you would see it looks virtually identical. It's very, very, very similar in amino acid sequence and in tertiary structure. If we were to compare the beta chain of hemoglobin to myoglobin, we would also see it's very, very similar. They're related proteins. They're not identical, but they're very, very similar. We can see in this figure, this little red disk here, this is the heme group that I was telling you about that binds to the oxygen. The heme group binds to the oxygen right there where that red group is. The structure of the heme looks like this. Okay? A set of rings in the center of which is iron. Okay? This structure um, also occurs in plants. It's known as chlorophyll. Only in plants, instead of an iron in the middle, they have a magnesium in the middle. Heme and chlorophyll are therefore related. They have their very different functions, but they're related. OK, now, I want to emphasize that this heme is physically, covalently attached to the rest of the subunit, whether it's an alpha subunit or a beta subunit or if it's a myoglobin. So the covalent attachment occurs uh, actually through uh, these various groups here, okay? And these various groups anchor it to the, to the protein. It does not come off. It's covalently attached. Okay. Now, I said these were very important for binding to oxygen. I'm going to show you something that's important for these proteins, and we're going to see that this very simple thing I'm going to show you about structure is remarkable, because this very simple thing I'm going to show you about structure enables you to live as an animal. This very one thing I'm going to show you today is the, the smallest possible movement you can imagine. And without this very small movement occurring within hemoglobin, your life as an animal would not exist. Okay? This is one of the most important things we can think about with respect to structure and function. We've been talking about how structure is important for function. Hemoglobin's going to bring it home to you. All right, what are we looking at here? Well, you remember I showed you the heme. We looked at it and we said it's a flat set of rings in the middle of which was iron. If we took that last figure I showed you and instead of looking at it flat like this, but we turned it on its side, we would see what we see on the screen here. So we're now looking at that heme group edge on. Okay? And when we look at it edge on, we discover that the iron is not just floating there. It's actually attached to one of the amino acids of the protein, that, whether it's the alpha subunit, the beta subunit, or the, the um, myoglobin. They're all the same. Okay? It's attached to the side chain of a histidine. All right? You with me? Now, if you look at the figure on the left, what you see is that heme group in the absence of iron, uh, in the absence of oxygen. I shouldn't say iron. It has iron, obviously. In the abs abs <laughs> absence of oxygen. When oxygen comes in and binds, we see the figure that's on the right. And you say, well, so what? The so what is if you look at the figure on the right and you look at the position of that iron, you'll see it has shifted up very, 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 very slightly. In fact, it shifted up by 0 0.4 angstroms. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10th meters. That's 1 10 billionth of a meter. That very tiny movement 
I'm going to tell you and hopefully convince you that this is why animals can exist. Okay? I hope I've got your, caught your attention with that. We have, gesundheit. We have on the left deoxyhemoglobin, meaning hemoglobin without, this is hemoglobin in this case, without oxygen. In this case, we have oxy when it has the iron. Has, has the oxygen. I keep saying iron. Okay. <laughs> I think everybody's allergic to me or to hemoglobin. I don't know. I hope, it's, well, I shouldn't say I hope it's hemoglobin. I guess that'd be a bad thing to be allergic to. All right. This shows us that um, the binding to the iron is actually to the iron plus two. The iron plus two can be in resonance with this structure over here, but it never completely oxidizes to iron plus three. If I ask you on an exam, what does the oxygen bind to, you darn sure better tell me it's iron plus two, because that's what it binds to, and that's the form in which we find it. If we oxidize it independently, and we have iron plus three in the heme, we will discover that no oxygen will bind to it, because it can't start forming this resonant structure. OK. Now, um, let's look at the oxygen binding of myoglobin to start. Okay. Here's a graph. I told you about graphs that when we talk about graphs, we have to label the axes. And that's absolutely essential. This axis on the y shows us the fraction saturation. That means what percentage of the myoglobins in this solution are bound to oxygen. 100% is right up here, and we see 50% is right here. We see oxygen concentration on the x-axis. So as the oxygen concentration goes up, what happens to the binding of oxygen by myoglobin? It goes up, and it goes up very, very rapidly. Okay? It's going up very, very rapidly. At a very tiny pressure of oxygen, 50% of the myoglobin is bound to oxygen. Myoglobin is really good at binding to oxygen. It's not so good at letting go of it. If we wanted to get that oxygen off, we would have to really decrease the oxygen concentration to a very low level before we would get a significant percentage of the oxygen off. Myoglobin is therefore very good at being what I call an oxygen battery. A battery is something we use to keep a computer going. We unplug our laptop from the wall, and it keeps on going because the battery keeps it going. This battery helps keep your muscles going. When your muscles get very, very low in oxygen, myoglobin has been sitting there the whole time hoarding the oxygen. And when the oxygen concentration gets real low, myoglobin goes, OK, have some oxygen. OK? But only when oxygen gets very, very low. Now what that means is that it is the myoglobin is not very good at carrying and delivering oxygen. It's really only good for storing oxygen. Let's look at the same thing for hemoglobin. The same study for hemoglobin. There's myoglobin shown in the dotted line. And there's hemoglobin binding of oxygen shown in red. A couple things we notice here. First of all, we notice that the curve has shifted significantly to the right, meaning that it takes more oxygen to get hemoglobin to the same state as myoglobin. Here was where myoglobin got 50%. Here's where hemoglobin gets 50%. And we can see it takes a heck of a lot more. You might say, that's bad. We want hemoglobin to bind oxygen. Nope. It turns out that's not bad because the concentration of oxygen in the lungs is way out here. Way out here. At about this range out here, we see hemoglobin has essentially about 100% of its sites bound with oxygen. Now, the advantage for hemoglobin isn't just the binding of oxygen. It's on the flip side. It's the getting rid of oxygen. When we get into our tissues, when we have tissues that need oxygen, their oxygen concentration is down about in this range. Well, if we get down into about this range, we'd say, well, maybe we have 80% of the oxygen has been dumped all right, when we're right here. But if we were to compare that to myoglobin, only about 15% would be dumped. Hemoglobin is much better 
at releasing oxygen where it's needed and binding oxygen where it's present. I'll repeat that. Hemoglobin is much better at releasing oxygen where it's needed and binding oxygen where it's present. Okay. Now, I've shown you the, the, um, the what of hemoglobin. Now I need to show you the how. How does this happen? Okay. Well, this happens because of that little movement that we talked about before. Okay. Here's the structure of hemoglobin showing all four subunits, two alphas and two betas. And for our purposes, the alphas work identical to the betas. We don't distinguish them. Each of them has a heme, and each of those hemes can bind one oxygen. Let's imagine I have a hemoglobin that makes it to the lungs, and it has zero oxygen in it, because it's dumped off all of its oxygen from the previous trip through the body. It gets to the lungs, and it has no oxygen bound to it. It's in what we call the T state. We'll talk about proteins having T states and R states. T stands for tight. Now, I, the, the image I like to think of is your uptight friends. Your uptight friends don't want to go out. They don't want to do things. They're not very flexible, right? They're usually not much fun, and they walk around like this, right? OK, well, if you imagine they do, that'll help, all right? So they walk around like this. They're not able to handle things. They slough them off. T-state molecules will tend to release things. They don't want to carry around excess baggage. Okay? This guy in the T-state, when it makes it to the lungs, is in the, this hemoglobin in the T-state makes it to the lungs, doesn't want to bind oxygen. Now, there's a bad thing for you. It doesn't want to bind oxygen. Well, you already saw evidence of that. The evidence you saw was it took a fair amount of oxygen for it to get started. It took more oxygen to get the binding process started than it took hemoglobin. Okay. Eventually, one of the hemes in this hemoglobin bound to an oxygen. And when this heme bound to an oxygen, that iron atom got changed 0.4 angstroms. So what? Well, the iron atom was attached to a histidine. And the histidine was attached to another amino acid, which was attached to another amino acid, which was attached to another amino acid. And by moving that iron atom a very short <coughs> distance, Gesundheit, by moving that iron atom a very short distance, I moved all of those amino acids a very, very short distance as well. In fact, that little tiny movement caused essentially a complete tiny change in this one subunit that bound to the oxygen. OK, you with me? Now, because of that, this subunit's the structure has changed very slightly. And that means its interactions with the other subunits has also changed very slightly. That interaction between, let's say, this guy and this guy now induces the pink guy to also undergo a change. And the change that the pink guy undergoes now causes it to want to bind oxygen. And now the pink guy changes like the yellow guy did. Okay, The yellow guy up here changes because its interaction with the pink guy changed. And we see, as this goes through the entire four subunits, that each time we see a change, we see an increasing desire to bind oxygen. What's happening is that this overall protein is converting from the T state to what we call the R state. R stands for relaxed. And relaxed states are really good at binding things. Really good at binding things. Changing this one atom allowed this guy to load up with oxygen. Now, animals need to have a lot of oxygen. We have to run. We have to jump. We have to escape from predators. Well, maybe we don't, but somebody has to escape from predators. We under evolved under conditions that that happened. Plants don't have to do that. Plants are stuck wherever they happen to be planted, right? They don't have immediate needs for energy. 
they don't have hemoglobin. This guy, this phenomenon I've just described to you called cooperativity, allows animals to load up their hemoglobin very quickly in the lungs and deliver it out to the tissues where it's needed. And it all happens because of that very, very tiny movement. When these guys get out to the tissues, the reverse happens. A little bit of the, hem of, of the oxygen comes off. That favors unloading of more. And now we can deliver oxygen to the places where it's needed. That's a really cool phenomenon. That's why the hemoglobin's ability to bind to oxygen under high concentrations and let go of it under low concentrations makes it perfectly suited for meeting the body's oxygen needs. Perfectly suited. OK? But wait, there's more. There's more, OK? Hemoglobin has some other properties that are remarkable. You notice in this structure right here, there is what we can describe as a donut. There's a donut. The donut has a hole in the middle. And that hole in the middle turns out to be one of the most important properties that hemoglobin has. This, bind, this hole in the middle, we will see, is a binding site for a very, very interesting and a very, very important molecule we call 2,3-BPG. Now I need to tell you what 2,3-BPG is. It's a small molecule. You don't need to know the structure. We'll actually talk about the structure later in the term. But it fits perfectly in this hole. All right? 2,3-BPG is a molecule that's produced by rapidly metabolizing cells. If I have a muscle cell and I'm exercising my muscle cell, it's rapidly metabolizing because it's using ATP. It needs to generate ATP. It needs oxygen to be efficient at doing what it does. It's producing 2,3-BPG. That's important because as hemoglobin comes trucking through my bloodstream, it hits that muscle where that 2,3-BPG has just been released. And 2,3-BPG says, oh, look, I've got a place to bind. And it binds in that little pocket right here. Okay. This binding of 2,3-BPG has a very drastic effect on hemoglobin. It converts it from the R state into the T state. What's going to happen to oxygen that's in that hemoglobin? It's going to get released, right? Because in the T state, the hemoglobin doesn't want to bind onto the oxygen. So this is a perfect delivery system, folks. We've got hemoglobin that's already just kind of dropping off ox oxygen as it's needed. But now here's a signal from the body that says, hey, I need some extra oxygen here. Dump me some more. And it ensures it happens by binding the hemoglobin and causing hemoglobin to just dump it all out there. That's pretty cool. Now you're thinking, OK, when this guy made it back to the lungs, you didn't say anything about 2,3-BPG being in there. And moreover, if 2,3-BPG were in here when it got back to the lungs, what do you suppose would happen? Well, it turns out that would be pretty bad, because 2,3-BPG locks hemoglobin in the T state. It makes it very difficult for oxygen to bind. Very difficult for oxygen to bind. So how do we get rid of it? How do we get it out of the hemoglobin? Well, it turns out that all these molecules that I'm talking about, oxygen, 2,3-BPG, and I'll talk about some others as well, they do not bind to hemoglobin covalently. And that's the key. When something doesn't bind covalently, it does what I call on-off. We can imagine coming on and bouncing right, coming off and bouncing right back on, just doing this, sort of breathing almost, if you want to think about that. As they're traveling through the body, that's what's happening. And that's how oxygen actually gets dumped, because it comes off for a second, and the cell grabs it, and hemoglobin doesn't get it. So after hemoglobin has picked up some 2,3-BPG, it's doing this on-off thing. And on its travels back to the heart, what's happening is 2,3-BPG gets grabbed by a cell, because 2,3-BPG is an energy source for cells. The cell is happy to take that 2,3-BPG. It's happy to use the energy from it. 
and hemoglobin no longer has the 2,3-BPG. So we've cleared the system. This guy now, it's still in the T-state, but it's not locked in the T-state. It makes it back to the lungs in the T-state, and the binding of an oxygen will convert it to the R, and we start binding more oxygen. We repeat the process over and over. It's a beautiful system, and it's a perfect system, except for one thing. If you smoke. If you smoke, your blood system has a much higher concentration of 2,3-BPG than if you don't smoke. What does that mean? Well, it means it's much more likely that you're going to have hemoglobins that's going to make it back to the lungs, bound to 2,3-BPG, locked in the T state, unable to bind oxygen. The reason that a smoker runs out of breath when they're climbing stairs or exercising is because 2,3-BPG is in their bloodstream, and it's reducing their oxygen-carrying capacity. Yeah, serious stuff. Yes, sir? OK, it has a higher concentration because you won't really understand that here, but because it's produced by rapidly metabolizing cells. Smokers have carbon monoxide. They have other things that are preventing their cells from functioning efficiently. So to make the same amount of energy, they've got to produce things more rapidly. And one of the things they're producing is 2,3-BPG. We'll talk actually more about that later, but that's, that, that's, that's why. Yes? So why are those cells that are highly metabolized? Why are they giving it off? Why are they giving it off? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. It turns out it's given off as sort of an accident. And we'll talk about it. That's true. Uh, it's, it, it's actually sort of an accident. And we'll talk about the way that it, the enzyme that makes it works when we talk about glycolysis. So remind me of that, and I'll tell you at that time. And this is a really cool process in itself. Okay. Other questions? Have I convinced you all to go start smoking? <laughs> yes? Does the same thing happen to people who are out of shape and so forth with that? Um, I would say not in the same way, no. Because with smoking, we have several things going on that's causing this phenomenon to occur. As I said, carbon monoxide um, is one of those. And we'll see that there's other effects that happen on, on the hemoglobin as a result of that. Not exercising has its own problems, uh, but it's not related directly to what I'm talking about here. Yes? So hemoglobin, can hemoglobin bind to CO2 like it does to O2? Can hemoglobin bind to CO2 like it does to O2? As a matter of fact, it can, and it does. And that's part of what's coming up. OK? Good questions. All right. Well, as I said, but wait, there's more. There's a lot more. We've only scratched the surface of hemoglobin. We've only scratched the surface. This graphically shows what I was telling you earlier about myoglobin versus hemoglobin. Forget this blue. The blue is just confusing. Okay? Myoglobin versus hemoglobin. And you can see that in the physiological conditions of the tissues, hemoglobin's dropping about, oh, 65, 70% of its oxygen, whereas myoglobin is only dropping about 7%. Hemoglobin's really good at delivering oxygen and letting go of it when it's needed. The good thing is, in the concentration of the lungs, the oxygen concentration is high enough to basically load up hemoglobin. It's essentially 100%, just like myoglobin is up here, in the concentrations in the lungs. Very, very cool. OK. And that's sort of reiterating the same thing here. OK. This right here is showing you, and it's a little hard to see, I'll be honest with you, but it's showing you that there is a difference in the structure of hemoglobin bound to oxygen versus unbound to oxygen. All right? And as I told you, that's a very subtle difference. And this figure enforces or reinforces the fact this is a very subtle difference. There's very slight change in going from here over here to over here. Very, very slight change that's happening. OK. All right. Uh, let's leave that alone. OK. Yes, question. Very good question. So can I envision the binding of oxygen and the releasing of oxygen as a cascading effect? And that's essentially what cooperativity is telling us. Yes. Yes. OK. Here's the molecule I've been talking about. You don't need to know the structure of that. 
This turns out to be a byproduct of the metabolism of glucose. And as I said, it's an accident. We'll talk about that later. You don't need to know the structure. You don't even need to know the full name. If you say 2,3-BPG, you got it. Okay. All right. Here's what happens if we add 2,3-BPG to hemoglobin. Okay? Now, this is exaggerated a little bit. It's making it look like there's not, that this is more like myoglobin, but in fact, it's not. The addition of 2,3-BPG causes hemoglobin's curve to shift to the right. As it shifts to the right, it means that it is um, going to bind uh, to um, oxygen in a different way. Okay? It's going to bind oxygen in a different way. And moving to the right means it's going to be more likely to let go of oxygen than when there's no 2,3-BPG there. Okay? So 2,3-BPG favors the release of oxygen. Here, uh, just one second, this shows the structure of the, that donut. And now you can see 2,3-BPG superimposed in the middle of it, exactly holding the thing together. Question? Yep. Yeah, good question. Everything is happening with the iron and the heme, but this isn't even binding to the iron and the heme. Yeah. This tells us. Remember I told you earlier that proteins are flexible. And the flexibility of the protein is what's driving this. If we change one part of a protein, because it's flexible, we probably are going to affect other parts of the protein as well. And so that's what's happening right here in, this, in these subunits. We're affecting a part that has nothing to do with the heme. We're going to see when we talk about carbon dioxide that you guys asked about earlier, that carbon dioxide doesn't bind to the heme either. But it favors the release of oxygen. Is there a question I saw a hand? OK. OK. So let's get to that nitty gritty I was telling you about here. All right? I, actually, well, let me think about it. Um, yeah, OK, let's do that here. All right, so as I said, wait, there's more. Hemoglobin is a remarkable molecule. Hemoglobin is what we need for oxygen. And when we think about, but well, wait a minute, there's a fetus. Fetuses need oxygen. And the only way the fetus gets oxygen is from mom. And if the fetus has the same hemoglobin as mom, the fetus is going to be in a constant battle with mom to see who gets the oxygen. And that's not a battle you want to have the fetus have. Right? Well, it turns out the fetus has an advantage. The fetus makes a slightly different form of hemoglobin called fetal hemoglobin. It's called fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin okay, has a greater affinity for oxygen than mom's hemoglobin. Well, what's the difference between fetal and mom's hemoglobin? Adult hemoglobin is, as I said, alpha 2, beta 2. That's the four subunits that we find in there. In the fetus, the beta subunits are replaced by similar subunits called gamma subunits. Called gamma subunits. All right? Now, those gamma subunits cause the overall shape of hemoglobin to change very, very, very slightly. What does that mean? Well, one thing it means is that the donut hole no longer binds to 2,3-BPG. It means, therefore, that the fetal hemoglobin will exist in the R state much more so than mom's will. The R state, you remember, was the state that was binding the oxygen in the lungs. And so as a consequence, the fetal hemoglobin has a greater affinity for oxygen than mom's hemoglobin does. Guess who wins? The fetus wins. OK? The fetus wins because its greater affinity for oxygen takes away the oxygen from mom's hemoglobin, and the fetus has what it needs. But you're sitting here thinking, but wait. Letting go of oxygen, the R state wasn't very good at letting go. It was the T state that was letting go of oxygen. Does the fetus have a problem? Is it, use, is it like it's using myoglobin? It's binding to oxygen, but it's not very good at letting go of it? Well, it turns out that the fetal hemoglobin isn't as good at letting go of oxygen as mom's is. 
But that's not a problem. The fetus doesn't have drastically changing oxygen needs like mom does. Mom climbs stairs. All the fetus does is kicks mom. That's the most exercise a fetus is going to get. So the oxygen needs of the fetus are lower. And therefore, it can afford to hold on to more oxygen than mom's does. Right? OK. So fetal hemoglobin is pretty cool. All right, but there's more. We need to talk more about what hemoglobin does going through the body. We need to talk about the Bohr effect. Okay? This was discovered about 100 years ago by a man named Bohr who was studying the binding of oxygen by hemoglobin. And what he discovered was interesting. If he took hemoglobin at pH 7.4, and he plotted its curve of binding, he got the red curve that you see above. And if he took the same hemoglobin and he put it at pH 7.2 and measured its binding curve, he saw that it shifted to the right. What does shifting to the right mean? It's letting go. It's got lower affinity for oxygen. The Bohr effect, or one of the aspects of the Bohr effect, says that the lower the pH, the less affinity hemoglobin has for oxygen. The lower the pH, the less affinity hemoglobin has for oxygen. Well, that seems a little odd on the surface until we recognize that rapidly metabolizing cells, in addition to producing 2,3-BPG, also produce protons. And what do protons do? They lower the pH. So not only is 2,3-BPG there telling hemoglobin, let go of your oxygen, the protons are doing the same thing. This is reinforcing, again, hey, buddy, better give us some oxygen here, or we're going to be in trouble. We need some oxygen. Okay. There's still more. Okay. The way in which this works is the protons that get into hemoglobin combined to various amino acids that can accept protons. This includes things like lysine, histidine, etc. And when we bind protons, what's going to cause, what's going to happen to the charges of those? They're going to change. And when the charges change, what happens to those ionic interactions? They're going to change. And when the ionic interactions change, what's going to happen to the structure of the protein? It's going to change. All this works in concert to favor the release of oxygen. Fortunately, when we get back to the lungs, these protons that get absorbed get dumped off. They get dumped off. So hemoglobin can go back to a state where it has a higher affinity for oxygen. There's still more. Okay. Rapidly metabolizing cells produce 2,3-BPG. They produce protons. And a third thing that they produce is carbon dioxide. It's a byproduct of metabolism. It's a byproduct of oxidation. Okay. If we look at the binding of hemoglobin by, in the presence of carbon dioxide and also in the presence of acid, what happens? Well, let's look at these three plots. The top one, pH 7,4, no carbon dioxide. That's the red one. The blue one is what we saw in the last plot. That is, if we change only the pH but not any carbon dioxide. The third one is, what if we add carbon dioxide? Well, look what carbon dioxide does, guys. It favors the release of even more oxygen. We've got three things in rapid, like, rapidly metabolizing cells that are favoring the release of oxygen. 2,3-BPG, protons, and carbon dioxide. They all work in concert to get oxygen to the place where it's needed. Pretty cool stuff. Okay. Carbon dioxide does not, repeat, not bind to the heme group. It binds to side chains of amines, like you see here, to form what's called a carbamate. Look what the carbamate is releasing, guys. Protons. 
Is that reinforcing? Again, the release of more oxygen? You got it. This guy makes it back to the lungs, and then the reverse process happens in the lungs. Now, I kind of glom over the process that happens in the lungs, but suffice it to say that in the lungs, we have a very different kind of circumstance than we have in the tissues. We have extraordinarily high concentrations of oxygen. And those extraordinarily high concentrations of oxygen in the lungs literally forces its way onto hemoglobin and helps favor the reversal of all the things that I've been talking about here. That's only made possible because we have a high oxygen concentration in the lungs. One more piece of information. There is something else that binds to the heme group that we don't want to bind to the heme group, but it does very, very readily. It looks just like oxygen, and it's known as carbon monoxide. One of the reasons carbon monoxide is poisonous to you is because it binds and displaces oxygen or replaces oxygen so that we have less oxygen carrying capacity. You suffocate. Carbon monoxide, as we'll see next term, has other effects in the body, but this is one of them. OK, that's a lot of stuff. Carbon monoxide binds to, the, to the, the, the iron in the heme group in the same place that oxygen would bind. So what it's doing is basically taking up a space that oxygen would go. And so as a consequence, you suffocate because you don't have any oxygen. Yes? Good question. Is that a reversible binding or is it binding a stick? It is a reversible binding, but it takes a while to get it off. Yes? Is carbon monoxide more favorable Is it more favorable? As far as I know, it's not uh, more favorable, no. But, it, but it, does, it will take the place of oxygen there. OK, I've got a song that brings it all together. I'd like to sing it, and then we'll call it a day. How about that? <laughs> to the tune of Santa Claus is coming to town. Let's go with it. Oh, isn't it great what proteins can do, especially ones that bind to O2. Hemoglobin's moving around. Inside of the lungs, it picks up the bait and changes itself from T to R state. Hemoglobin's moving around. The protoporphyrin system, its iron makes such a scene. Arising when an O2 binds, pulling up on histidine. The binding occurs cooperatively, thanks to changes quaternary. Hemoglobin's moving around. It exits the lungs, engorged with O2, in search of a working body tissue. Hemoglobin's moving around. The proton concentration is high and has a role. In between the alpha betas, it binds imidazole. To empty their loads, the globins decree. We need to bind to 3BPG. Hemoglobin's moving around. The stage is thus set for grabbing a few cellular dumps of CO2. Hemoglobin's moving around. And then inside the lungs, it discovers oxygen and dumps the CO2 off to start all over again. So see how this works? You better expect to have to describe the Bohr effect. Hemoglobin's moving. Oh, 